Right, how's everybody doing today? Y'all doing good? You should be, you should be doing great. Extra hour of sleep, all that stuff. There should be, uh, should be an eventful day. I shouldn't have to worry about uh, trying to get you to be engaged. Because uh, again, you had that extra hour of sleep. We should be ready to roll. So it's good to see some of you. Some of you were on time today. That means you forgot uh, to do something to your clock. So just do that every single week. That's great. Uh, good job. We are two days away, two days away from an election, uh, which is going to be super, super interesting. And uh, I'm actually really excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. How many of you, I just need to know who I'm talking to. How many of you have already voted? Raise your hand if you've already voted. Okay, good. Let me get an idea. Put your hands down. How many of you have not yet voted, but you're going to the next couple of days? Uh, that's good as well. I'm surprised how many people uh, have actually already voted. I don't believe the polls. I don't believe any of the statistics. You can lie with statistics very, very easily. And so that's why I wanted to ask the question myself to see how many of you have already voted. And uh, I'm glad that this time that stat in particular was right because I changed the message up a couple of weeks ago for today, knowing that most of you have probably already voted. So what I want to do is I want to talk about something that is super, super important over the course of the next, not only, not only in the next 40 minutes or so, but over the course of this week, next week, and then the week after, because I think that in a lot of ways, this is more important than, the, than you actually think that it is. But I want to acknowledge something on the front end. Number one, I hesitated to do this series on the week of an election because when emotion gets high, common sense gets really, really low. And so as a result, uh, whenever all this stuff, like people were on the edge of their seat, Jesus himself could stand on this stage and preach this message verbatim. And some of you would be like, I don't know. I don't know about all that. It feels like Jesus might be wrong. No, I promise you that Jesus is not wrong. I also promise you that I'm not Jesus. But what I am going to try to do is I'm going to try to point you to Jesus as we evaluate and think about what it is that we're supposed to do in the context of an election with, let's be honest, and I don't care if this is offensive, with two very imperfect candidates. What is it that we are supposed to do in an election cycle, in an election season uh, like this one? Um, sometimes people will ask me, and I'm sure they will. Somebody probably already did it online. It's just the nature of the online beast. Uh, but uh, people will ask probably, why is it that you're even doing this series? Is the church getting more political? The church is not getting more political. That is a gaslighting phrase by people who don't want the church to speak into something that everybody else is speaking into. And I promise you this, that if the church won't disciple people, the media would be glad to do so. And so I think that no, the church is not getting more political. The government and politics, think about what it used to be about. It used to be about speed limits, building bridges, building roads, and math standards. That is what the government and politics was all about. Now, over the course of the last you know, couple of election cycles, it seems as if the government and politics is more about life in the womb, gender identity, religious liberty, and indoctrinating kids in school. So no, the church has not gotten more political, politics has gotten more spiritual. And because of the fact that politics has gotten more spiritual, I think that probably we should speak into that. Wouldn't you agree? And if you don't agree, that's okay. You have the right to be wrong, but we will speak into what it is that God has told us to speak into. Because if God's word talks about it, guess what? We're going to. If God's word talks about it, we are going to do so as well, whether it's popular or it's unpopular or it'll get you canceled or it won't get you canceled or whether people like it or they don't like it. I can't just preach messages that people like. If I do, I'm not a prophet, I'm a prostitute up here for the highest bidder. So what I wanna try to do is just tell you what God's word says regardless and let the implications fall where they may. Is that fair? That's fair. Now. Weeks and weeks and weeks ago, many of you, we were doing another Tough Topic series, and I actually had you repeat this. I'm not going to this time, but I actually had you repeat it, and you said, I would rather my pastor tell me what I need to hear rather than just what it is I want to hear. I would rather my pastor tell me what God's word says rather than just what it is I want to hear. I hope that you still feel the same way. Uh, whether you do or not, I'm going to do so. So 
buckle your seatbelts. You had an extra hour's sleep to get ready for it. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun throughout the course of this message. And I really do believe that it's going to be a lot of fun. But we are going to talk about stuff like this because it's super important. God's word talks about stuff like this. And I also think that it's important to know that uh, political parties back in the day, they used to agree on destinations. They just disagreed on how to get to those destinations. Now, political parties have two totally different destinations. And so what we want to do is we want to ask the question, with everything in life, by the way, not what does culture say, what does God's word say? And then based on what God's word says, we adjust our life accordingly, even if it is against our tradition. Because God's word is the word for our lives, right? I hope that that's not weird for you to hear a pastor saying, but God's word is the mandate. God's word is the standard for our lives, period. Regardless of what anybody else says, God's word is what it is that we have to stand on. And so we're gonna do our best to do so. I also need you to know, though, that this is something that's been going on from the beginning of time, honestly. You have, uh, throughout the course of this series, you're going to hear me talk about uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 is where it is that we're going to basically dive in. And you had a scenario where Israel, they weren't divided left and right. Israel at the time was div divided north and south. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom at the time was led by a king by the name of Ahab. And Ahab was you, everything that you don't want in a leader, that's what they had. Ahab was a horrible policymaker and he was also a horrible person. Those two are bad combos. You don't have to be both of those. You can be a good policy, policy maker and a horrible person. He just happened to be both. Not only that, but he wasn't good at choosing a wife. He chose the worst wife on the planet. Her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel, um, she almost ruined the name for all of eternity. She was not the greatest individual on the entire planet. She was, he married her for a political alliance, going against God's word. He married her for a political alliance. And when he did, she brought the worship of false gods with her to the nation of Israel. And so she brought the worship of Baal and Asherah, which is basically the gods of money, power, and sex. I don't know if that sounds familiar at all, but that's what it is that they were worshiping back in that culture, which to be honest, is not much different than what we worship in this culture. Money, power, and sex. She brought it with her. So when she got there, remember where she was, she was in Israel, God's chosen country. And there were a lot of prophets and there were a lot of people who initially were willing to speak out against her. But she and her passive husband by the name of Ahab, they ended up killing a lot of the prophets of God or scaring them into hiding or scaring them into silence. And because of this, they were able to basically do whatever it is that they wanted to do. And even the people of God were just following along. And the nation was standing at this, at this precipice, so to speak, and they were standing there. And the question is, what is it that they're going to do now? What happens now? We're going to talk a lot about that next week. And I need to let you know this because my daughter, Lexi, asked me the question. She said, hey, dad, depending on who wins the election, is the message going to change next week? And the answer to that is no. I've already had today's message and next week's message planned for like the next six weeks. So well, no matter what it is that I talk about next Sunday, know that it was planned before I knew what the results were, all right? So I don't want anybody being like, ah, oh, he changed his message because so-and-so won, and because so-and-so won, he preached angry and blah, blah, no, no, no. I've had this message prepared, right? I've had this thing prepared. It is ready to go. go. I can pull you to it and show it to you right now, but I don't have time. I ran out of time at the nine, and if I'm not careful, I'll run out of time at the 1015. Y'all ready to listen fast? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Answers. That's good. Three of you are. The rest of you don't care. <laughs> Just know this. My goal is not to pull your heart left or right. My goal is to pull your heart up into the kingdom of God so that you can look down and you can evaluate more clearly. That is my goal. Not left, not right, up. But when you're up, you have a better vantage point where you can evaluate what it is that is going on around you. I'm going to start with a couple of myths, three, three myths 
that most people believe, even followers of Jesus, three myths that most people believe about politics. Here's the first one. The first one that many people believe are that politics are just not that important. There's a lot of people that believe politics are not that important. Here's what you need to know. Almost every single freedom that you and I enjoy in this country called the United States of America is a result of followers of Jesus who had chosen at one point to go into politics. Almost every single freedom that you and I enjoy are because people who loved God went into politics. That is the reason we get to enjoy the freedoms that you and I get to enjoy. I pray often that God would raise up godly men and women who are not for sale, who would go into politics to truly make a difference, not only for this nation, but for God's kingdom as well. I pray that often. I hope that you will join me in praying that exact same thing. But a lot of people just don't think that it's important, especially when you have an election. I feel like the last, let's just talk about the last two, the last two elections where you evaluate the candidates and you're like, the best that America has to offer. Because <laughs> listen to me, and I don't care if this is offensive or not. If you look at the two candidates and say, man, these are the best, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And as a result, a lot of people are like, I'm just not going to vote. It's not that important anyway. It doesn't even matter. It says in the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2, pray for kings, in our case, presidents, and all who are in high positions. Why? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Wouldn't that be nice? Just to be able to live life in this country peacefully and quietly and not have to worry about every time we open up our news app that there's going to be some new war breaking out across this world. To be able to live a peaceful and a quiet life, we are supposed to pray for that. But not only pray for that, watch this, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. So let me stop here for a second. This was Israel, but they weren't in Israel. They had been kidnapped and brought to Babylon. And they're saying, God is to them, seek and pray for the prosperity of Babylon, the place where you don't even live full time. Pray for their peace and pray for their prosperity so that, or because of, if it prospers, you too will prosper. So we are to pray for the peace, we are to pray for the prosperity, but we're also supposed to seek it. How do we seek it? We either run for office or we vote for those who are running for office. We pray and we seek. It is not either or, it is both and. We pray and we seek. Politics are important. Go to the second one, but they are not most important because a lot of people believe that politics are most important. And these are the people who right now are about to have a panic attack even as they sit in these chairs. And you're already thinking about what is gonna happen over the course of the next 48 hours and you are like revved up and ready to go and you are anxious and you are cynical and you're filled with despair and you don't even drink but you went out and bought a whole bunch of whiskey. Like, that is you because you are doing whatever it is you gotta do to make it through the next 48 hours. And the reason some of you are laughing, and some of you, three of you, I just saw you hit the person next to you, <laughs> which was your signal to listen to what the man is saying up on the stage. I won't, I won't call you out, don't worry, just look at me, we'll get through it together, it'll be fine. Some people believe that it's not important, some people believe that it is most important. Those of you that believe it's most important, you drove through your neighborhood and one of your neighbors had a sign promoting the wrong candidate, whichever one it is that you define as wrong. And your first thought was not, I'm gonna pray for them to know Jesus. It was, how can I sneak over there in the middle of the night and steal that God forsaken sign? <laughs> have you seen those videos of people stealing the political signs and they have them electric and all of a sudden they grab it and they're like <laughs> I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, that's funny right there. It's not godly, but man, that's funny. <laughs> Some of you believe that politics are most important. If you care more about how your neighbor votes 
than you do where it is your neighbor is going to spend eternity, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Politics are not most important. Jesus uh, was able to bring people together from different persuasions, different backgrounds, different political uh, mindsets, and he was able to unite them in a more pressing cause. The example would be like Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. By definition, if you go in a study about those two guys, they were on opposite ends of the political spectrum. And God, Jesus, brings them together, unites them around a common cause that was greater than some type of political allegiance. In other words, Jesus was able to show that the gospel flag can fly higher than a political one every day of the week. Jesus proved that. So for us, as followers of Jesus, now we're getting ready to dive into some of the stuff where you're gonna be like, oh, you're gonna like, your butthole's gonna get real tight right now. (laughs) Yes, I said that out loud. I forgot it's on video, but you know I'm right. We refuse to let the politics of men divide the people of God. We refuse to let the politics of men divide the people of God. That part's easy. That part's not difficult. Now let's dive in. We're gonna disagree without division, but we do not disregard God's word because it goes against our preferred political party. We refuse to go against God's word, even if it makes our preferred political party look bad. We refuse to go against God's word, even if it means in a particular election, we have to jump across the aisle and go to the other side. Because for us, my platform is not my standard when it comes to politics. God's word must be my platform. And I will stand here, and if a party moves, it's not a guarantee that I move with it. I will stand on the authority of God's word. And I'm just talking about me. I'm talking about every follower of Jesus should adopt this. As a follower of Jesus, we will stand on the authority of God's word, period. That is what it is that we are going to do. Now, Let's have some fun. Here's the third one. Third myth. Politically, God is always on my party's side. Politically, God is always on my party's side. That is a myth. Politically, God is always on my party's side. So one time Joshua, not the Joshua sitting next to you, but in the Bible, there was a guy named Joshua. And Joshua has this encounter with an angel And Joshua 5.13 says, Joshua went up to the angel and he asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the angel responded, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. It is less whose side is God on and it is more what does God's word say about every single issue? What does God's word say about every single issue? Notice what I'm not saying. What do my feelings say? That's not the question. The question in my foundation cannot be, what do I feel? Do you know why? Feelings will change and feelings will lie. So my foundation is not built on my feelings. My foundation is built on the unchangeableness of God's word. So the question then becomes, what does God's word say? Not my feelings, not culture, not what's popular, not what may get you canceled. We cannot be more loyal to a party than we are to biblical principles. We cannot be more loyal to a party than we are to biblical principles. So here's the tough question everybody has to answer and you have to answer it consistently because platforms of these parties will shift and change according to the opinion polls of the people. Because we are led by people who are for sale many times. So when it comes to this, here is the question that we have to ask. Will we evaluate our politics through the filter of our faith 
rather than creating a version of our faith so that it can support our politics. Let me say it one more time. Will you evaluate your politics through the filter of faith rather than creating a version of your faith that supports your politics? Here's why that question matters. Uncritical acceptance, uncritical acceptance of your preferred political party is not loyalty, it's idolatry. Uncritical acceptance of your preferred political party is not loyalty, it is idolatry. Let me give you an example, real time. We do not have a true pro-life candidate in this race. The Republicans have shifted. The Republican stance on abortion has gotten softer and is now what used to be the Democratic stance on abortion about 12, 16 years ago. Both have shifted. The Democratic side has moved this way. The Republican side has moved this way, but they're both moving. Uncritical allegiance means that if I'm voting on one particular side of the aisle and all of a sudden they start shifting on biblical principles, I have to be willing to say, hold up. You're moving in a direction contrary to what is God's word. And if you keep doing it, you might not always get my vote because I don't have uncritical allegiance to anyone outside of my father in heaven who is the son of the living God. I'll be an equal opportunity offender throughout the course of this message. Here's what you do need to know. Even though the Republicans have shifted more in one direction, there is still one party that is far more pro-life than the other. But if you're going to be pro-life, it is very important that you are pro-life from the womb all the way to the tomb and not just at birth. So all of these things matter. And it's not, it doesn't just matter politically, it matters scripturally. Jesus said that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have what? Life and have it to the full. There are some things that when we look at them, some, some I don't have time to talk about all of these, but there are some major platforms, some major issues that have massive biblical implications that are on the ballot this particular cycle. And when we look at those, we need to ask which direction is the most biblical direction for our country? I don't have time to name all of them. I'll name four. Here's one, religious liberty. Religious liberty is on the ballot. An example of that would be as a pastor who does weddings very rarely, but occasionally, if I do weddings for a person, should I get to decide whose wedding it is that I do based on biblical convictions or should the state be able to tell me whose wedding it is that I do? That's on the ballot. Another thing that is on the ballot is biological sex. Did God create mankind, male and female? Or do we get to determine that on our own? That is on the ballot. Massive implications. It's on the ballot. Another, the role of the family. There's four institutions. The individual, the family, the church, and the state, the government. If we're not careful, we're going to allow the government, the state, to start knocking the legs out from underneath the family. Erasing gender, aborting in a, gener a generation of people. And if the government knocks the legs out from under the family, the family disintegrates. And guess who gets to step in? The government. The government then begins to say, we are your protector, we are your provider, we are your source. We will be the one to make sure you're taken care of. We will be the one to make sure you have money in your pocket. That's not the role of the government. That's the role of the individual and the role of the family. 
the answer in this country is not bigger government it's better families we can't allow the government to knock the log the legs out from under the family that's why this stuff matters it's all on the ballot another one the one that gets talked about the most is the right to life abortion is a big deal it's not a political issue abortion is a spiritual issue I know there are dozens and dozens and dozens of women that call Freedom Church home who have had abortions I have talked to you you have talked to me we have messaged each other and I have made it very clear forgiveness is available as a result of the person of Jesus there is nothing you can do to outrun the grace of God in your life that decision does not define you God can step in but I know there are people on television who celebrate their abortion but I have never personally met one every person that I've talked to with tears in their eyes has said, I wish I could take it back. I was scared. I was young. I was poor. I was alone. That's why I said, if you're pro-life, we need to be pro-life from the womb all the way to the tomb. Otherwise, we're not truly pro-life. And it's important that we are. All of these are on the ballot. Know this, both parties will get things wrong, but both are not always equally right and equally wrong. That can change election to election, by the way. But as far as this year is concerned, those of you that have not voted, you're asking the question, who is the most right and who is the least wrong this election cycle? when it comes to not the person, but the policies. Because the President of the United States, the talking heads, the bigger issue are the policies that they represent and the people that they appoint. Each president will appoint about 10,000 people. They themselves, 150 to 200, those 150 to 200 will appoint more and those people will appoint more. It comes out to about 10,000 people in the context of the United States government. So we have to ask the question, who is going to elect people that are more likely to stand on biblical principles and to create policies that are more in tune with what God's word would say? Not who is perfect, because if so, we don't have a candidate. Just write somebody in. Some of you are like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write somebody in. I'm going to prove a point. You ain't proving a point. You, you don't prove a The only point anybody cares about Tuesday night is who won. So you'd be like, I proved a point. And everybody's going to be like, what the heck are you talking about? You didn't prove no point. All you proved was that your vote didn't matter. So how should we vote? This is when everybody gets tense. They did it at 9 to 10, 15, you know, How should we vote? Here's how we vote. As a follower of Jesus, here's how we vote. We forget the talking heads for a second and we say whose policies are more in accordance with God's word on the major issues. Look and see. Your vote, it matters, it matters. It matters because that's your right to pick the best available path forward. This is a biblical principle. It says this in Matthew chapter five, verse 13. You, talking about you and I, are the salt of the earth, not just the church. It doesn't say you're the salt of the church. It says you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. What was he talking about? Salt, especially back then, even still today, but especially back then, salt was a preservative. The goal of salt was not just to make food taste better. The goal of salt was to slow down decay. 
That was the goal of salt. Slow down decay. So when you are the salt of the earth, as a follower of Jesus, for those of you that are, you're asking this question. Whose policies are most likely to slow down the decay of society? Whose policies are most likely to slow down the decay of society based on those four things that I said? And then there are others just for sake of time. Those are the only four I mentioned. Whose policies are most likely to slow down the decay of society? You need to know this. and This is not doom and gloom. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble but to take heart because I have overcome the world. Do you know what has happened to every major power throughout the course of history? What happens eventually? Eventually, they're not in the same position as they used to be. America is not always gonna be the nation that we are right now. We're not. It's like, for us, what Jesus was saying or what God was saying to them pray for the peace and the prosperity of the nation that I have brought you into exile. If you're a follower of Jesus in a lot of ways, this is the nation in where we find ourselves in exile. We are awaiting our forever home in a place called heaven forever. But while we're here, what we are gonna do is we are gonna do our best to seek the peace and the prosperity of the greatest nation on this earth by being the salt to preserve and to be the salt to slow the decay so that we can be the light to shine forth God's truth as far as we can, as brightly as we can, for as long as we can. That's what we are called to do, to be salt and light in the greatest nation on this planet. Don't listen to the lie. People, somebody sent me a message the other day and they just said, you're a Christian nationalist. I was like, you're 14. Define that. I literally told him to define it. He's like, I don't, I don't know, I heard it. It's people that love their country and love God. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of both of those. I love God and I love the country. Don't listen to the gaslighting labels that people push on you. People are like, don't, you can't push a Christian agenda. If we don't push a Christian agenda, what agenda are we going to push? If followers of Jesus don't stand in the gap, there's a lot of ungodly people who are willing to do so. And so we've got a responsibility. We've got a responsibility to slow the decay, to be salt, and to spread God's word, to be light. So some of you, you're like, man, I've never been so nervous. I'm anxious. If, if so-and-so wins, we're going to hell in a handbasket. Oh, my children are going to die the next day. It's going to be terrible. Listen, no matter what happens, here's what I promise you. My God is in control. He knows what he's doing. He holds the world in the palm of his hands. And no matter who I call president, I serve one king. And that is King Jesus. And no matter who is president, here's what I promise you we will do. Not just me, but you as a follower of Jesus Christ and a person that calls Freedom Church home. No matter who the president is, we will pray for them, and we will cheer them on, and we will pray no matter who wins, that the Holy Spirit would draw them to himself and that either he or she would say yes to Jesus and their life would be changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for them. And notice I said, for whoever wins. God is in control. You can be concerned, but you don't have to be scared. You don't have to be scared. You can have hope. You know why? Our hope is not found in DC. Our hope is found in a person who was crucified on a cross and then came barreling out of a tomb, defeating death, hell, and the grave three days later, just outside of Jerusalem. That's where we find our hope, is in the person of Jesus Christ. He is our Lord, He is our Savior, and He is our King, and in Him we will put our trust. But while we're here, we're going to do our best to slow the decay, to shine the light, 
to stand on God's word, even if it means voting differently than we've ever voted before. Because now we have eyes to see and ears to hear and a vantage point because we didn't get moved left or right. We got moved up into the kingdom of God and now we can look down and we can evaluate and say, there's four or five major issues. Where do we stand biblically on those four or five? And then I trust you through the power of the Holy Spirit to vote for the candidate that most accurately aligns with God's word, period. Would you do me a favor, stand to your feet all over the room. I'm gonna pray us, pray for us right now and the band will come and do their thing. Dear Lord, I love you, I'm grateful for you. Lord, I'm so grateful that we can talk about hard stuff. I'm grateful that we can talk about some things that so many people in the world consider divisive because that's what the media wants. God, I'm thankful that in the midst of all that, that you are the one who unites us, you are the one who brings us together, that no matter who is president, you are our king and you are our source and you are our provider and you are our hope. You are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end and the first and the last. God, you are the one. And so Lord, we trust you. We put this election in your hands and we ask that your will be done. God, I pray for each person here, help them to do their part, but God help them to do so in a way where they have hope and they can speak about that hope so they can talk about the person of Jesus Christ, no matter what it is that takes place on Tuesday. Thank you in advance for what you're gonna do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.